Well, uh, Danvers has a long history. It dates from the 1630s. Um, when Salem was settled in 1628, uh, some of the settlers eventually came inland uh, to an area that was good for farming and they established about 1636 what became Salem Village. And Salem Village uh, was a part of Salem Town, uh, continued for a number of years, uh, wanted to actually break off from Salem, uh, but wasn't able to do so until about 1752 when they became a district and then 1757 when they became a township. Uh, most people know of Danvers from its old name, Salem Village, because of the witchcraft events that happened in 1692. And um, we certainly have a rich uh, history and heritage uh, relating to those sad events. Um, Danvers uh, is the kind of community that um, is good for an example community in that all of the things that were happening nationally happened on a smaller scale in Danvers. So the revolution, uh, which uh, began in the hearts and minds of many people in uh, Danvers beginning in the 1760s, continued until uh, April 19, 1775, when over 300 Danversites uh, heeded the call that the British were marching to Lexington and Concord. And, um, Danvers responded with nine companies uh, and lost seven men in the engagement. They were very active during the Revolution. Um, you can just look from the antebellum time to the Civil War to the uh, post-Civil uh, War era and Danvers kind of mirrors what was happening at least on the eastern seaboard and uh, often nationally. The Danvers Historical Society was created back in 1889, 125 years ago. by Reverend Alfred Putnam, who wanted to preserve the town's history. It was a really creative time in American history. The, it was almost as, as if the nation was recovering from the Civil War, finally, and they created many, many different historical societies around the area. They created the Boston Symphony. Most of your civic institutions go back to right about 1889, the 1880s. The Historical Society owns a number of properties. We have four sites. We have 10 structures. I am sitting right now in the library, the first floor library of the Endicott Mansion, which is a 16,000 square foot building that dates back to 1648. It's in the middle of the Farmer Endicott Estate of the Loving Acres of Farmer Grounds. On the grounds, we have the National Historic Landmark Derby Summer House, house that was built in 1792. It's one of less than 2,500 National Historic Landmarks in the country. And we also have a little gazebo that was brought back from Russia in 1840 by one of the family when they were an envoy to the court of the Imperial Tsar. The first thing we do for example, when we took over this building in 1963, is we bring in consultants so that we can make sure that any improvements we make to the building, any repairs are done so that the architectural integrity and the historical integrity of the building is preserved. That can include all sorts of research through historical records, photographs, uh, digging down through various layers of paint in the property, uh, trying to find comparable woods. It's rather a complex field and we leave it to the experts. A few years ago we rewrote our mission statement to be very simply to educate about and preserve the history of the town of Danvers and we have expanded our educational programming greatly since then. We have the third grade history week, and this year we are having 291 third graders and 14 of their school teachers coming in to look at the properties and do various exhibits. We have um, collaborations with Salem State, Endicott College, uh, North Shore Community, in which we have interns coming in. Well, this year um, Danvers High School decided to have an internship program. It's the first time 
and I thought that it'd be like a great experience. I would regret it if I didn't. And I want to major in history. So I contacted um, the woman, Miss Guerreri, Kathy Guerreri, and she was so pleased to have me. And I want to do an internship, most importantly, because I, want, I believe learning beyond the classroom. So like more hands-on interactive than just learning history facts in a history classroom. For history, I had to put together, um, we had an open house on May 9th, and I had to put together exhibits um, on like um, transportation and industry um, in like the late 1800s. So I learned a lot about industry in Danvers. Like for example, there was a shoe industry called Ideal Baby Shoe, and it was ran by this woman named Mrs. Day. And I learned all about like her business. It was like in the early 1900s, and like I've never heard of it until my internship. So I thought that was interesting. I honestly didn't know a lot of history of Danvers except for like what I've learned in like elementary school. Um, so it was kind of nice to learn like local history as opposed to like you know like what we learn in school, like general American history. One of the other functions of the society is that we advocate for the historical preservation of the town's historical assets. We are constantly on the lookout for articles related to the town's history that may perish, that we can acquire for our collections. We have over 14,000 cataloged artifacts in our Tapley Hall collections and another 2,000 artifacts in the various buildings. The Archival Center is another component that was originally started in the basement of Tapley Hall. And the Historical Society was the sponsor and the driving force with Richard Trask to create a town archival center. Initially, uh, the Archival Center was part of the library department. But the library didn't have any space and it was a wooden building, so it was really a dangerous building to put precious things in. Uh, so the Danvers Historical Society uh, volunteered to allow us to use their basement, which we used for um, about 10 years. We also had it early on that all of the paper of the Danvers Historical Society, the manuscripts, um, would be placed in the archives. So once we built this structure, uh, a nice addition to the Peabody Institute Library, we had the forethought to be able to uh, design an archives here. Today, the Archival Center holds over 100,000 documents, pictures, diaries, journals, and other written materials that belong to the Society on permanent deposit with Richard Trask and the Archival Center. It's been a win-win situation for the Society and for the Archival Center. Uh, Danvers has many historic structures that uh, have disappeared over the years. Um, some Midland doesn't matter, but some very important. And uh, it's always sad to look back at some of the uh, beautiful architecture or historically significant structures that we've lost. In more recent times, the entire Danvers Hospital, Danvers State Hospital complex was a uh, about, th about a quarter of a mile long in high Victorian uh, style. And that was um, uh, basically torn down except for a small portion of it. The Danvers State Hospital was somewhat of a tragedy. Uh, the S Historical Society was all for trying to save it. I, with uh, the pres a few members of the, former members of the Preservation Commission, actually filed suit to save it, but we lost the suit and we lost two-thirds of the Kirkbride building, which was the most uh, expensive building the Commonwealth of Massachusetts had ever built up until that time. So we've lost a lot of things. Luckily, we've continued to preserve some things as well, because what makes a community unique among all of the others is basically three things. It's the people who inhabit it, or who inhabited it and now are dead, and what stories they had and what, what they've left of their memories and of their experiences in written format. Uh, you have the environment itself, uh, the hills. We have a lot of drumlins in town, Folly Hill, Lindell Hill, and so forth, uh, which make it different from Kansas or Nebraska or California. Uh, and then the built environment, uh, the actual physical structures 
that people made that kind of reflect themselves. And uh, those three things, when you lose any one of them, you lose a, a part of the, the community and the, uh, the significance of it. One of the issues we face with the Danvers Historical Society and also the Danvers Alarm List with the Rebecca Nurse House and the Daughters of the, Daughters of the American Revolution with the Samuel Houghton House is that no one knows about us in comparison to Salem. So this year, for the first time, the three organizations are having an open house of their various properties on the second Fridays of each month through November. And we are also starting to work with tourism, especially the cruise ships coming into Salem that wish to have a more substantive historical perspective and tour of the local history. So it's important for anyone anywhere to preserve those things that are unique to them. We're humans, not animals. Uh, and one of the differences with humans versus anything else is that we collect things and that we can think about things and we can think of the past and project into the future. You go to any um, store and uh, you go to the checkout and you see all these tabloids about uh, exposés of uh, actors and actresses and whatever. Well, history is basically that. Sometimes it's not quite as exciting, but other times it is. Today, where everything is media, where everything is electronic, we can bring people back into time in which they can experience it in reality. You walk into these buildings, you can walk into this mansion and you walk through the front door of that mansion, you follow in the footsteps of President Taft, President Cleveland, President Teddy Roosevelt, President Calvin Coolidge. And you'll ask why did they come here and we'll tell you why and then you'll really learned that Danvers was a very important part of American history.